So when, uh, when Judy uh, sent out the email a bit ago uh, asking people to uh, give ideas for speakers, uh, you know, I proposed myself for a couple of things, which she jumped on. I said, one of them, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of buzz in the press and whatever about Bitcoin, and, uh, but very few people really understand it uh, or understand really what it means. So I thought <coughs> that uh, I could make an attempt to explain Bitcoin and blockchain because they're two different concepts, but they go together in relatively uh, simple English and then see if, uh, just to bring people up to speed as to what this is. So I want to talk about four things uh, this morning over the next 15 minutes or so. I'm going to start out talking about a couple of economic concepts. We're going to talk about the economic concept of cash. And then we're going to talk about the economic concept of commodity. Then we're going to talk about the concept of a ledger accounting. And then with those three concepts sort of understood in our minds, I'm going to talk about Bitcoin, which brings all three of those things together. So let's start out talking about cash. <coughs> forget, for, forget for the moment, you know, the dollar bill in your pocket. Uh, let's say it's lunchtime, and Ron and I meet up for lunch. And I happen to have two slices of pizza, and Ron has two cans of soda. And we agree uh, that I'm going to trade one of my slices of pizza for one of his cans of soda, so that each of us now have one slice of pizza and one can of soda for lunch. What is the value of a slice of pizza in that transaction? A can of soda. A can of soda, right? And vice versa. Now, if I had four slices of pizza, and we did that same trade, you know, the value of uh, uh, a pizza is halved, okay? So right away, there's a concept of supply and demand in terms of economic exchange. So if I, uh, <clears throat> it's a very hot day, and uh, I've been working in the yard all day, uh, and I'm thirsty, I'm sweating profusely, and I go to the corner store for a beer. The owner sees me coming. How much could he charge for that beer? A lot, okay. He, because he, uh, because in that case, my demand curve is incredibly inelastic. I don't care what he charges for the beer. I am thirsty. I am hot. I want it now. So he could charge me fifty bucks for a beer that you could get for you know two bucks at Legends, and I would be willing to pay it depending on the elasticity of my demand curve. These are concepts that you learn in, uh, when you take beginning courses in economics, but they're important. Because when we get to cash itself, you know, we take a dollar bill out of our pocket. All this, it, 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 does this have any value? In and of itself, is, does it have any value? No, it has absolutely no value in and of itself. The only reason that it has value is because I believe that somebody else in this room is willing to take it as value for something to give to me and they're willing to take it because they believe that someone else will take it from them for something of value. Cash like this is nothing more than delayed barter. In, our, in my original concept I talked about the pizza and the soda, that was a barter transaction. Now what we do, what we've done over the centuries is that we've moved away from barter to delayed barter by creating currency. And as long as everyone believes that there is value in this currency, it's a matter of faith. There's no value in this piece of paper whatsoever in and of itself. The value is that someone else is going to take it uh, from me in exchange for something of value. What happened in Germany in the 1920s? The currency was worthless. Currency was worthless. People lost faith in the currency. So in the morning, it may have taken 
a thousand marks to buy a loaf of bread. By the afternoon, it cost 10,000 marks to buy a loaf of bread. By the next day, it was a half a million marks to buy a loaf of bread because people lost faith in the currency. So first of all, just the concept of cash. Currency is delayed barter, and its value of, at any given time is based on the faith and credit of the people that are exchanging it, and that, that, and that can collapse at any time. So we have a basic concept, first of all, just with cash. So let's move on to commodities. <laughs> commodities are things of value that are usually in high demand and are limited. So the, the more demand there is for something and the, scarce, the scarcer it is of the commodity, the more value the crowd puts in the commodity. So gold is an example. Gold is a commodity. Uh, people want gold. Why do people want gold? Well, over the centuries of all the metals, uh, gold is pretty. Gold is very malleable. You can create many things out of it. And it doesn't oxidize. So gold, you know, this gold ring on my finger never changes color. It never interacts, you know, with the atmosphere to oxidize. If I had a copper ring, by this time it would be green because it would have oxidized, it would have mixed with the air and, and turned green. If it was a, uh, an iron ring, it would have turned red by combining with oxygen. So over the centuries, people put a value in gold, and gold is limited. Yes, we still mine it, but there is still a, an upward limit on gold. So as long as people demand it, and as long as it's scarce, people will want it, and uh, there'll be a demand for it, and therefore its value goes up. Now, that's, just because something's a commodity doesn't mean that it's always going to go up in value. Uh, what happened in uh, Netherlands in 1636? Was that the tulips? The, yeah, the tulip mania. <laughs> you guys went to college, right? <laughs> the, uh, so, in, 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 the, in the late 1500s, uh, tulips are a, uh, a flower that are indigenous uh, to Turkey in the Near East area. And in the, uh, in the middle 1500s, they were imported to Vienna you know, through the interchange with the Ottoman Empire and things like that. And because it's such a unique flower relative to the normal flowers in Europe, uh, people started getting a high demand you know, for tulips. So if you were wealthy, you wanted to buy tulips for your garden. That indicated that, uh, that you were wealthy and you had high taste and things like that. That came to a head in 1636 in Holland. Now, by, at that time, the Netherlands was probably <coughs> the richest nation on the earth uh, through their trading. And so there was a lot of currency available and a lot of demand and upward mobility in the middle class, so a high demand for tulip bulbs. That started a tulip craze. So people started not only buying bulbs, they started investing in future bulbs. So, all right, I have, uh, I have tulips right now, and they're going to create bulbs uh, in two or three seasons. All right, so someone is going to give me money for the right to have one of those bulbs three years from now, you know, when it develops. And then someone is going to give them money uh, for the, the next three years. So everyone is just speculating like crazy on getting hold of tulip bulbs, and the value of tulip bulbs, it didn't even exist yet, got larger and larger and larger and larger. There is a, there's, there is a concept in economics called the uh, psychology or the madness of the crowd. Uh, and there's a book written by Thomas McKay around 1840 uh, that first uh, described this economic behavior. Uh, and that, well, that's what was happening in the um, in Netherlands. Is it really that bad? Am I really that boring? So anyway, the, the, what happened is that, you know, so the madness of the crowd kept raising the value of these non-existent bulbs until it reached a point where people realized that this whole thing collapsed. This was like one of the first huge economic global bubbles, and it collapsed. And a, a number of people lost fortunes because they had invested, you know, 
thousands and thousands and thousands of builders in bulbs that were going to come out in the future and didn't exist, and all of a sudden, all of their investments were worthless. Now, we've seen bubbles uh, in, in the Western economy all the way uh, since then. But so, I just wanted to give you a concept of cash, and we understand what that is a little bit. Now, we understand the concept of commodities and how the madness of the crowd drive, how limited uh, supply, large demand, and then the madness of the crowd can create value and reduce value in commodities. Any questions on that so far? Is it sort of generally clear? Okay. Now, let's talk about ledgers. Ledgers are a way of keeping track of things. Uh, most, most of you uh, of a certain age you know, still have a checkbook, and every time you write a check, you record the check in, uh, in, the, in the ledger in the checkbook. <coughs> Nowadays, nobody does that uh, because they, they, you, can, you can log on to the bank every morning and look at your balance and whatever. But <coughs> the whole idea of ledgers over the years was that uh, I would maintain a set of accounts of what I own and what people owed me. You would maintain a set of accounts of what you uh, owned and what people owed you. Every now and then we would get together in the pub and we would compare our books and we would balance, okay, I owe you this, you owe me this, we're just going to write each other off and, and uh, you know, vary us from Paul's book and I'll put a credit on my ledger and uh, we move on. Those of a certain age uh, will remember with banks uh, the, the idea of passbook savings. They don't exist anymore. Everything you now is ledger savings. Still yes, have. you still have them. <laughs> no, you, you, no, you will be talked out of it if you ask for a passbook savings. You go to Columbia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. The, uh, yeah. So uh, the, the whole idea was that the bank has has a ledger of how much you've deposited. And in your passbook, you have a ledger of how much you deposited. And hopefully, you know, over time, the two of them agree with each other. And that's why you every now and then do a reconciliation. But still, there, there is a period of time uh, be, between that reconciliation. <coughs> so ledgers are simply organized ways of recording anything. But in the concept of our discussion, they're a way of recording economic transactions. Uh, checks that you write, deposits that you make in the bank. If you buy stock, there is someone who's keeping a ledger for the corporation of everybody who owns the stock and how many shares. That's a ledger. Right? So <clears throat> that brings us now to what a blockchain is. A blockchain is a public distributed ledger uh, that is all electronic. So it, from this point in the discussion, paper kind of goes out the window. All right, now, now, we're, now we're in the world of the cloud and uh, bits and bytes and computers. So in the uh, mid-2000s, uh, mid a technology was developed called blockchain, uh, which is a distributed ledger system. Nobody owns the ledger. Now we go back to our bank example. Uh, you make the deposit in the bank. The bank has a system which it owns that keeps track of the money that you've deposited. You have a passbook which you own. It's a ledger that you, you keep track of the money you deposited. Nobody else knows that. The bank has its system. You have your system. And they're separate ledgers. In blockchain, everybody has access to everything. Nobody owns the ledger. It is public. It is in the cloud. You can access it by simply downloading the software uh, from, uh, <clears throat> from the cloud, from, you know, from the web, and establishing a blockchain ledger on one of your computers. Companies, use, companies can use this because it's, since it's very public, it's very transparent. It's almost impossible to steal uh, anything in a blockchain because everybody who has a node on the chain has, uh, is able to see all of the transactions that are happening at any given time. Uh, why is it called blockchain? Well, because transactions are stored or created in blocks. Blocks are <coughs> large numbers, uh, unique numbers, that are then stored, and then the next transaction 
builds off all those numbers and creates another set of numbers which are related to the first set of numbers. Each of these numbers are referred to as blocks. The blocks are chained together so that I can't go in and, and alter this block because two things are going to happen. One, the software is going to say there's something wrong with this block because it's not a mathematically consistent with the previous block and the next block. Secondly, since all of the blocks exist on all of the computers that are part of the blockchain system, if I try to do something with mine, you know, Ron's going to get a warning, Paul's going to get a warning, you know, uh, Lloyd's going to get a warning. There, there is something wrong with uh, a block in the system. It is, it is invalid. So everyone has transparency to what is going on. It doesn't mean that everybody knows who it is. It just simply knows that it is. Blockchains can be very public and informational, and they can be very private and informational. So we have, we, so we have the concept of cash, concept of commodities, concept of ledgers, this concept of blockchain, which is a new kind of ledger that is publicly distributed uh, for things. And, and now we come to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a commodity. It is, some, it is a digital cash, it's digital currency that is not owned by any government. It's public. It's, sim it's like gold. All right? you, can, you can mine gold. Now I have a block of gold. I have something of value. It's only of value because someone else is willing to give me something of value for it. The same thing with bitcoins. Now, bitcoins were created uh, in 2008. Uh, a gentleman or a number of people, and I always get this wrong, so I'm going to take uh, 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 Satoshi Nakamoto is, is, is the name, put up in the public cloud uh, this software to create and mine what are Bitcoins. So when you think Bitcoin, don't think of a, don't think of a, like a quarter or a piece of currency. A Bitcoin is a chain of numbers. It's a very unique chain of numbers. Right? And those, that particular kind of number is referred to in uh, mathematics as a nounce, N-O-U-N-C-E. A nounce is a number that is only used once. And so that once that number exists, it cannot be replicated. Now, <clears throat> So he, uh, this group or this person, we have no idea, it's very anonymous. Uh, the name in Japanese is a very common name. So if, if someone from the United States was doing this, John Doe would have put this up in the cloud. Right? So we don't know if it's one person, we don't know if it's a group of people, we don't know if it's really Japanese. We have, we have no idea who started this whole thing. But they created the software and they created the first block, what's called the Genesis block. So they generated the first Bitcoin. Now, the software, what makes this a commodity is that first of all, there's a limit. Under the software, only 21 million Bitcoins <coughs> can be created or mined or, or, or be in existence. Now, in 10 years, since 2008, uh, about 15 million of the 21 million Bitcoins have been discovered or mined or calculated, and I'll get to that in a minute, how that happens. So we still have another 7 million or so Bitcoins to discover. How do you discover the Bitcoins? You do it by buying or licensing or renting extremely powerful computers. The computers themselves are ext extremely expensive. The processors are extremely uh, powerful and you need at least a half a gigabyte, if not a terabyte of disk space uh, just to store and recover the information that is going on as you calculate the Bitcoin. How do you calculate the Bitcoin? The Bitcoin is, like I said, it's a unique number. And it's a number that is calculated based on certain rules that are in the Bitcoin software. And then they have to be validated by all of the different Bitcoins that have been discovered to date. And it's a, it, it's a unique number. There is a random number of zeros 
that have to, uh, I say, there's a really, really random number of zeros that have to precede the number, and then the number has to be calculated based on this complex algorithm, and then it has to go through a what's called a hash process, uh, which is a calculation of all of the bitcoins created to date, to say, to say that yes, this bitcoin meets all of the mathematical concepts uh, of all of uh, everything that's in the program. So if, you, if I have an extremely powerful computer, it might take me between 10 and 30 minutes uh, to mine a Bitcoin, uh, probably longer. Now, if you successfully mine a Bitcoin, the current value is about, uh, uh, it, it, and you put it out on the blockchain system, you get credited uh, 12, 12 bit Bitcoin credits. When, the, when Bitcoin was first established, the value, the commodity value of one Bitcoin was 30 cents. A year and a half ago, that value had risen to $20,000, the demand for a Bitcoin. That has fallen back since then. This morning, yesterday, average this week, the value of the Bitcoin is around $7,000. Now, what, so why do I want a Bitcoin? Well, you really don't. But the, uh, the whole idea is you can use bitcoins like currency. And one of the values is, is that it's very anonymous. I, I can, uh, if I want to buy something, you know, from Ron, I can send him the number that I own. And remember, the system knows that this number exists. So if I try and send him a number that doesn't exist, the blockchain is going to say this is an invalid bitcoin. It'll keep track of the fact that a Bitcoin changed hands. Now, I, I've gotten something of value from Ron. I've gotten a car, I've gotten a house, I've gotten gold, whatever it is, or I've gotten cash. You can actually trade Bitcoins for real American currency. And now he owns the Bitcoin. Nobody knows that he owns it. He, it's just that, that there is a valid Bitcoin out in space. Ron has it on a thumb drive. If he loses that thumb drive, or if that thumb drive gets destroyed, the Bitcoin disappears. All right. So, and uh, we figure economically that once all 21 million bitcoins have been calculated, uh, about a third of them will have disappeared, either because of computer crashes, hardware crashes, people lost the thumb drive they were storing them on, or whatever. So, <clears throat> bitcoin is an electronic. It's a, it's a number stored electronically. That's very difficult to calculate. In fact, it could take more, more, the cost of electricity could be greater than the value of the Bitcoin at any given time, <laughs> you know, in, 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 computing, in computing the value. If you have this commodity, you can use it uh, to purchase things because the madness of the crowd says that this commodity has a particular value, just like stock has a value or gold has a value. That value is going to ship up, up and down over time. Like I said, you know, two years ago it was twenty thousand dollars. Today it's seven thousand uh, dollars. Bitcoin is not the only currency, electronic currency out there. There's a number that have come since then, but that's the most popular. So, without that's about as deep as I want to go uh, in terms of explaining this. I'll certainly answer any questions. Quickly.